Thank you so very much, Stephen. That was both informational and inspirational, the deep questions and engaging them profoundly, and knowing that partnerships are being built to effectively do that is very significant. Um, and uh, and, and it, we now transition into our ongoing dialogue, and it is my pleasure to introduce to you Paul Viviano, uh, President of Children's Hospital Los Angeles and also Board Chair of the Board of Trustees of Loyola Marymount University. Carol Bailey, a professional ethicist and an ethics consultant in the healthcare industry. Part of this ongoing dialogue is this reflection on the responsibility of industry and sectors to thinking deeply about social impact and their commitment to make the world a better place, wrestling with those questions of good, bad, right, wrong, as you were describing. And so what we now want to do is have the opportunity for thinking about how other industries are engaging those questions. The next two panels will focus on healthcare, and it's my pleasure to welcome and introduce Carol and Paul. Thank you, Jeff, for that lovely introduction. Thank you all for being here today. We had a third panelist who wasn't able to join us, so we've gone from a kind of a panel discussion to more of a, a fireside chat. And um, we'll have a little discussion about social good and about um, you know, how healthcare organizations deal with these types of issues. And um, we hope you find it of interest. We'll have lots of time for questions at, at the conclusion of our comments. But we'll start with a little bit of a self-introduction. So Carol, if you wouldn't mind starting, give us a little bit of overview of your career and what you do professionally. Um, you're looking at a retired person. <laughs> you look so happy. <laughs> um, I retired in, on September 4th um, from a job I had for 23 years as uh, the Vice President for Ethics and Justice Education at Dignity Health, which is based in San Francisco but has 40 hospitals in California, Arizona, and Nevada. Um, I did both um, medical ethics support and consulting, and also business ethics support and consulting. And I, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about um, the way that I think that, in the healthcare industry at least, um, we started out by thinking ethics was about, you know, should we withdraw the respirator from grandma if the son is saying yes, but the daughter from New York, who's the lawyer, is saying we'll sue you if you do. The cases like Jahai McMath, uh, you know, um, brain dead, uh, cl clinically called brain dead, but something still going on in her. The family moved her to New Jersey, and she kept growing and changing. Um, those medical ethics issues are one thing, um, stemming from a history of abuses and such. The business ethics issues are, I think, more what will be uh, formative for these new industries coming. So that's my background is kind of both of those things. How about you? So my, my background, I've been in healthcare management my entire career. And um, you heard I, I work at Children's Hospital Los Angeles, which is, uh, which is a nationally ranked children's hospital. And, and, and we're a safety net organization. And that has a lot of implications, uh, both socially as well as clinically. Um, I spent my entire career in, in healthcare management for about 16 years. I worked for the Sisters of St. Joseph of Orange um, in their healthcare system. The last six years or so is responsible for all their operations. And um, the Sisters of St. Joseph, of course, one of the sponsors of Marymount College and now Loyola Marymount University. So there's a lot of connections. And my very first role um, as a board member at LMU, um, Father Lawton was still the president, and he asked me to chair the, um, the Bioethics Institute mm. at LMU, which was brand new. So it was a great introduction to the campus. And as, as Jeff outlined, I continue to serve on the board and currently serve as the board chair, where we do encounter lots of ethical kinds of issues, less so from business, more so from a higher education perspective. So um, we've got a lot of experience and a lot of context uh, this afternoon. And, and why, why don't we pursue the, this, this context a little bit about um, ethical-based Catholic organization. How, how do you how do you get your leaders to to adopt and embrace social good, social responsibility, um, ethical behavior? What, what, what's what's the path? 
So most Catholic organizations are not different from other organizations. You probably remember this from both your St. Joe's time and also your children's time. There are always a set of core values. And if they stay in the frame with a really pretty inspirational picture by the elevator, they're dead and they don't do much. Well, I think the answer to your question is, to, is that we need to talk about what the values are rather than just name them. We're for integrity. We're for transparency. We're for stewardship. We're for dignity. We have to say what those things mean. And when we make a decision, we have to, we have to link those decisions, those business decisions, to the values that are shaping our, our action. And I can, I can give you a good example. And having a process to do that actually helps, I think. You know, that's right. <laughs> um, having a process for having your values shape your decisions, I think, is something that is, is one way that leaders can embrace the values as pushing the decisions, rather than the decisions resulting in your your, the transparency of your actual values. If you're always making a decision um, that will protect the financial interests of the top dogs, that comes out eventually. Um, if you're always making a decision with an eye to the least well-paid employee, that comes out too. Um, but let me tell you this little story. We had, um, so Catholic Healthcare West at the time, Dignity Health now, 40 hospitals. Lots of IV tubes and IV sets are used in a hospital, any hospital. So we had a contract with Baxter, which is a big pharmaceutical company. We've also had a, an environmental commitment um, since the founding of the organization to protect the earth and the, the sustainability thing of this place is wonderful. Um, so we say to Baxter, you know, the thing that the, the, the substance that keeps plastic in the IV tubing plasticized, flexible, is on the California toxics list, DEHP. It's very bad. It's bad when you make it. It's bad when you use it. It leaches into the IV tubing, affects the fertility of infant boys particularly. And it's also bad when you try to get rid of it. When you burn it, it goes into the air. When you bury it, it goes into the soil. So we say to Baxter, we realize having a plasticizer is really important. That's why we do business. I mean, we need it. But you have a mental um, commitment. So what are you doing to look for an alternative? And Baxter said, now Baxter, like, how, how many have heard of Baxter? Right. It's a big gorilla, right? We say to Baxter, so what are you doing? And they say, well, it's in the pipeline. We say. Good. Could, could, we, could we see the pipeline? Mm -hmm. We look in the pipeline, it's empty. The pipeline is empty. They are not working on alternative plasticizer. There's another organization, small little German company, B. Brown. They have an alternative, but they're tiny. We have 40 hospitals. They couldn't possibly. So we gathered a group. We got the stakeholders involved including the hospital presidents who were going to, their budgets were going to be affected if we paid more, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the sustainability vice president, me, a couple of other people. And we tried to look at it from the standpoint of the values of the organization, knowing that we would have to sell the decision, whatever it was. And then Baxter said, well, it's true we don't have anything in the pipeline, but we'll give you a really good deal on the poison. So now we have the two, the two countervailing, the, the two competing interests, financial stewardship, which was one of the values, stewardship, and this, this commitment to protect the earth. So having the conversation about which of those two values should carry the day was the substance of that process. So I will tell you the end of the story was a happy ending. It isn't always. Um, when we gave all the money that we were giving to Baxter 
to B. Brown, this tiny company, they scaled up. They now service all of our hospitals and all of your hospitals and most hospitals in the United States. But we wouldn't have come to that if we had just said to Baxter, um, we need an alternative, but if you don't have one, we'll, we'll take a good financial cut. We'll take a good deal. So that's, that's a great, my story. That's a wonderful story. So when you think about the kind of all the levers to pull relative to ethics, decision making, leadership, social good, there are a couple different ways to think about it. One is hiring the right mm -hmm. kinds of leaders. The second is orienting those leaders to your values and your mission. Um, third is incentivizing and then kind of reinforcing. Maybe you can talk a little bit about each of those and, and the steps that, that Dignity um, took to make sure they were hiring the right people, training them the right way, incentivizing them the right way. Because all those things have to align, in my experience, in order to really be effective in, in um, sort of transforming an organization. And I will say, and then I, I want to turn it back to you because I want you to answer oh, that please. question. Um, we got better at that. Mm -hmm. um, when the organization was run by sisters who were formed in a certain way, had, had a certain set of beliefs in common, were, were there to do good for the community without asking too many questions about what, meant, what good meant or was there a lot? There wasn't a lot of diversity among the sisters. They were pretty similar to each other. Um, we did it by the seat of our pants. We got much more conscious about how to do that as time went on and as the sisters uh, left and as we got a much more genuinely diverse workforce. Not that the sisters were narrow-minded, because I think they're really a species of women who are not narrow-minded, but they were mostly white, they were mostly a certain age, and they were mostly from a certain kind of a background. How do you do that? Well, it, 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 it's, 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 a hard, it's a hard equation. And so um, for us, we started with our board. And so we, we have a, a, a mission. And um, you, know, we can, you can recite it because it's everywhere throughout the hospital. But it's really caring for every child, um, regardless of how ill they are, regardless of their immigration status, regardless of their financial capabilities. And we, we talked with our board about you know, th those priorities. And, it's, um, it's interesting, every once in a while we'll, we'll, we'll appoint a new board member and they'll say, you know, we could make a lot more money if we just did these three things. And um, oftentimes those three things included something that would undermine our mission. Mm. And so th there, there's a board reinforcement, a teaching, a training that goes along with it. And that um, this focus on what is best for the patient and the family sort of transforms everything and that what that is what takes precedent over everything including our financial performance mm -hmm. and again those are hard things to to bake into an organization but it literally has to start at the top and work its way through you've all heard the the the, the story about how important culture is and to build a culture it took the sisters decades to build a culture that they built and that allowed um, lay people to come in as the sisters began to shrink in numbers um, to, to make sure they, they adopted and embraced that same culture. The same is true in, in any organization, ours included, that we, we have a culture where we have our priorities um, focused on that social good, on, on that mission of caring for everyone. And it's a hard equation because mm -hmm. it puts a lot of pressure on, on everybody, um, but it, it is sort of a calling. Mm -hmm. And so these, are, th these literally are a calling. Mm -hmm. How do you, um, how have you, seen a change in, in your career, I wouldn't even say just at your current job, but in your career from caring for the people in front of you to a kind of a broader social impact? It's certainly been one of the, one of the um, most um, prevalent changes in my career to see this evolution of um, we're here to take care of an episode of, of acute illness mm -hmm. versus we're here to do the, serve the community's needs. We're here to improve the population's health. And those have, those have transformed the industry. A lot of it was accelerated by, uh, by the ACA mm -hmm. and, and the work that Congress and um, the former administration did in, in that context. And so I do think that um, kind of connecting with some of the theme of your conference about artificial intelligence, I do think that data, the availability of data, 
electronic health, health records and other data that, that can help inform how do you improve the, the base of population across a, a broad base as opposed to I know the protocol to care for someone with an acute MI or uh, an appendix that needs to be removed. <coughs> And so I, th I think it, it has mm -hmm. it has been a big change, but it's also put a lot of pressure on mm -hmm. on the systems, mm -hmm. and um, it, it, it's driven us to a level of learning and adaptation that wasn't in the industry before. Mm -hmm. But it's been marvelous to observe, and we never never catch up. We're still yeah. Well, it's like they say, it's like having one foot on the shore and one foot in the boat. Yeah. And because we're moving toward population health, but we're not reimbursed that way. Yes, exactly. <laughs> we're not there yet. Um, and I think I think the you know the current status has, has been a little more complicated because um, the ACA began to push the healthcare industry into um, accountable outcomes and and performance, and with a change in in direction, um, it is a little bit back to fee for service and. Um, providers being compensated for what they do and how much they do, which is a mixed incentive at, at, the, at the very least. And so th there, there's a lot of tension in, in healthcare and those that can rise above that tension and focus on the right things because their culture allows them to do so are the ones that are gonna really um, One really of the things succeed. you said about um, data, um, we've seen a huge change in, so hospitals, as we know, um, are a kind of a, a late-breaking social development. You used to get sick in your home and either get better or die in your home, and then with every success of war, we got more and more things we could do to save people. We could amputate, we could, antibiotics were developed, we could intervene, and then we built these great big hospitals that you, instead of the doctor coming to your house, you went to the doctor's house and on their turf and on their schedule for your bath and your meals and your medication and your surgery, they made you better for the most part. Um, we're, we're now getting to the place where because of the way healthcare is paid for in this country um, and also because we now have the vision, we, we've <laughs> We've pretty well cured most of the quick killers, the things that used to take you out real fast. And so what's left are chronic diseases like diabetes, like heart disease, like cancer that used to kill you quick and now kills you slowly, um, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease. And what we're discovering, especially for the chronic illnesses that need to be managed, not Alzheimer's, not Parkinson's, for which there's very little that we can still do, and they're just as much a, a strain on the social um, network as they are the medical network, frankly. But what we're recognizing is the emergency room is like the worst possible place to take care of a person with diabetes. She comes in in a diabetes crisis, and we fix her up, and if we send her out, we used to just close the door and say, gee, we hope she does okay. Now we watch as she goes and we say, oh Lord, she doesn't have a place to live. She lives in a food desert. She can't eat those things we told her will keep her from being in a diabetic crisis next time. So now we're starting to invent systems and technology and data has helped us do this where we are connecting the non-food desert grocery stores with the diabetes educator, with the homeless counselor, to make sure that when she walks out our door, she falls into the arms of a, of a, a network that can actually help her from coming back. We don't want her back. We want her to be healthy there, and we'll be there if she crashes again, but there are so many things that people with congestive heart failure and diabetes and some of those other chronic things, and that's all because the systems are networked now um, so that people can find each other. So that, and that, that doesn't happen without somebody, some person or persons saying, what's keeping us in business is not what's good for out there. What's good for out there is if they don't come to us. So let's make sure they do better out there. 
So the, the incentives in the system are, are still murky. There, there are lots of incentives to do different things. It, it, does, it, it does track to the confusion and the tension in healthcare today. And so while from a societal standpoint, there's no question keeping that diabetic out of the emergency department at home and healthy, eating healthy, getting regular medication, et cetera, is best for society. Who owns that on right. an ongoing right. longitudinal basis is unknown. And so, that's very similar to this, um, some of the things we heard Steve say, which is that it's, it's big and diffuse and we have to try to make sure all the parts are talking to mm -hmm. each other. And, and the revenues associated with these things mm -hmm. have become overwhelming. And so when you think of now one-fifth of the, of the gross domestic huh. product, roughly, is in healthcare, and the, the size and shape of the economics of, of this are absolutely overwhelming. And so I, I don't know exactly what the revenues are of Dignity for 40 hospitals, but it's pretty impressive. It's, it's, big, several, it's yeah. several billion. And so one little, one little uh, you know, kind of fact that I do know about, and so Children's Hospital Los Angeles, a freestanding, one of, the, one of the largest children's hospitals in the U.S., has about four times the revenue, if you think of it, if you think of revenue as the basis of a business, compared to Loyola Marymount University. And so it, it is remarkable the size of, of the revenue base mm -hmm. And um, before I, I, I came to work at Children's Hospital, I worked at um, UC San Diego, where I was the Vice Chancellor for Health Sciences. And again, if you think of UC San Diego as a, as a business for just a minute, it's a great university, it's about $4 billion a year of revenue. About $2.5 billion came from the health system, mm -hmm. came from the medical school that I was responsible for. Mm -hmm. That's how overwhelming the revenues are, and that, that same rough estimation of size, if you went to UCLA, if you went to UCI, if you went to USC, their healthcare enterprises are well more than half their, their, their budgets. And what's even more important is that they have debt associated with that, that infrastructure because it costs a lot of money to build buildings and buy electronic uh, medical records and those kinds of things. And, and to capitalize this, a lot of organizations um, do have a lot of debt, and the debt makes you do things mm -hmm. that um, sometimes you wish you didn't have to do in other organizations, and um, it also makes you um, really prize these decisions even more that, that do risk um, doing the right thing, and you still have to, you still have to make your debt payment uh, mm -hmm. next quarter. So that, that's part of the tension in the system. That brings up another point, um, I think, about when you think about um, how you, how you do good in the world, um, part of it is making sure that you're not the only one or your, your team or people who think like you are not the only ones who decide what good is. Uh, we learned that in medical ethics big time um, when we said, when we let doctors and nurses in the medical establishment say, we're gonna save you. What's good for you is for us to cure your cancer. Okay, it's gonna, chemotherapy and surgery, uh, so it's gonna make you a little sick, you're gonna lose your hair, uh, but we're gonna save you because that's what's good for you. When we started listening to patients, that was good for some of them, but it really wasn't good for others ones, others of them. Some, some people are at the end of their lives, they're ready to go, and they actually don't want to be subjected to my idea of the good. Thank you very much. So finding who's good we're talking about is one thing. The other thing is um, any individual person or actually any institution and even in terms of society, the good is defined by more than financial strength that's one aspect of good, but it can't ever be the only one. Yes, uh, a strong bottom line lets you do a lot of other things, um, but if you don't have time for leisure, if, you, if, you're, um, if your sense of human relationships is distorted, I think, I think there are a lot of things that define the good for any individual person, or actually any, in, any institution. I think there are a lot of things that define the good. Let's dig in a little bit to, to some of these issues that, that you mentioned in terms of an, the ethics context. And so tensions in the environment, um, 
practitioners wanting to do everything they can to keep a patient alive, um, not just from a clinical standpoint, but also from a, a legal standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, a lot, there's a lot of defensive medicine that's practiced so people, practitioners can avoid being sued. Um, obviously, it's very expensive. You've got patients who have an opinion about, I don't want a surgery or I don't want chemotherapy, some of the, some of the more difficult things. And we've got Catholic social teaching that um, ha has opinions about these very same issues as well. So maybe you can talk about how, how those kinds of um, decisions are weighed and, and, and balanced in, in, a real, in real time. Well, for... Um you know, Catholic hospitals are an expression. Catholic Church is the church you love to hate. <laughs> um, and on the one hand, um, those of us who are more critical um, want to say there's a certain section of the population that sometimes the Catholic Church does not seem to see. And they are people who look like me and not like him. Um, so women's reproductive issues are a big source of tension in the Catholic medical thing. Um, but th that being said, Catholic hospitals are an expression of uh, the free expression of their founders' religious convictions. So on the one hand, you won't get a sterilization or an abortion at a Catholic hospital. And some people will say, well, that's not fair. You know, hospitals are for everybody. On the other side, you say, well, uh, yes, but ho uh, we, hospitals will take anybody who wants to come. You probably don't want to come here if that's what you want to have. You want to go somewhere else. So we can't do everything for everybody. Um, I would call that the, the church's moral teaching. Um, the church's social teachings are pretty hard to, it's pretty hard to find an argument that sticks against the church's mm -hmm. social teaching. So for example, the dignity of the human person, a really basic um, formative uh, aspect of Christian anthropology. So Christian anthropology meaning the way a Christian, a Catholic, the, the Catholic view of the human person is basically that it has two important assets, uh, facets. One is that every person has dignity. It's not, it, you don't have dignity because I give it to you. You have it. I better recognize it but you have it. So it's inherent in an individual person, not because of what they do or who they are or who their daddy is or how much money they make. It's there because they're a reflection of the face of God, period. The other aspect of Catholic, uh, a, a Christian anthropology is that those individual persons are constituted in a community and that you only become your full human self if you are in community. And when we talk about the common good, it's what has to be a feature of that community in order for individuals to thrive. And as I said, you can, you can argue with the church's moral teaching that hasn't quite caught up with the 2000s yet, but this is, remember, the church that, that apologized to Galileo 500 years <laughs> later. So, you know, not quick to act. But the social teaching, which is about human dignity and the common good, that's kind of one for everybody. Um, at, least in, at least for the founders of this country and also the way we think about it in this country. So I'm, I'm curious about you. So which part? Um, how do you see Catholic social teaching shaping uh, decisions that God got made or get made? Well, I, th I think they are high, high level and, and you know, are, are guiding principles. And where, where we need clarity on a day-to-day -day basis is the practical discussions around mm. should your pharmacy stock birth control pills? 
you know, real practical issues, like you say, that aren't necessarily social teaching, mm -hmm. but can get extrapolated. Again, that, 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 that's, that's a nuance that is restricted just to Catholic hospitals, but I do think the end-of-life decision-making, I think, does put pressure on individuals, on families, um, when they seek counseling about what, what can they do, what should they do. You know, California has some, some, some pretty liberal laws, and um, how that plays out in terms of practical decision making in a sponsored organization can, can be a bit of a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, and yet individuals have the right to, 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 to make those decisions. And so as practitioners, you honor those rights, knowing that in certain hospitals you can only do certain things. Assisted suicide, and never done in a Catholic, in a, no. any hospital. No. It's not just a Catholic no, hospital. That's right. that, that has to be done. Place, that that yeah. has to be someplace else. Yeah, yeah. but, no. but it, it, it's the more nuanced ones. The mm -hmm. obvious ones are obvious. Mm -hmm. But but it does. It, it, it is an interesting time ethically for for providers mm -hmm. because of um, technology advances mm -hmm. and um, and other pressures in, on, on on providers. So. You know, when you said about um, the pressures of technology, one of the big learnings of bioethics, in fact, that sort of where bioethics, aside from the Nazi atrocities, one of the central, which that was about, um, the, you know, the German medical establishment was the pinnacle of medicine in the world at the time. Um, and it wasn't kind of one bad apple doctor um, that, that conducted the Nazi experiments. It was a whole German medical establishment that had bought into the goals of National Socialism. Um, so, there, so I have two lessons from bioethics for, about, uh, f from that for us. One is that when the goals of a profession match too closely the goals of an unreflected political system, you're in trouble. That's one thing. But the thing that I was, I got distracted by that. The thing that I was going to say is one of the lessons of bioethics is just because the technology is there, must we use it? So just because there is a respirator, should we artificially ventilate every single patient? Just because we can do a valve replacement, should we? The, the ethics developed in this country because people said, hmm, technology has a life of its own and will keep developing, and it's by and large a good thing. But humans have to decide at some point whether that technology fits their human goals or undermines their human goals. And I do think that is a good lesson for our topic, um, is whatever technology it is, is someone or someone's uh, groups that, um, as Steve said, need to involve the people that the technology affects, not just the people who create the tools? Um, does it serve our human purposes? And, and we, need, we need ways to organize that conversation, I think. So one of the sort of source of tension, but it's, it's certainly relevant to that, has to do with insurance companies and what they will approve and won't approve. So there's a third dimension. The, the, the technology exists. Mm -hmm. The patient can decide whether they want it or not, and then someone's going to have to decide if they'll pay for it so or not. For it, right? And because most, most of those kinds of things are, are uh, unaffordable for, for many families. And so there, there, again, there, there's, there's lots of tension within this context of the desire to do good and What's, what's right for a patient, and um, not to pick on the pharma industry, but I, but I will for just a minute. Um, Go ahead. And that is, so we, we're one of the trial sites for, uh, for gene therapy for childhood blindness. So there are seven trial sites in the, in the world. And so we've done two patients, and these are, these are um, one, one was a, kind of an older, um, an adolescent, one was a, a six-year-old young, young girl, and um, blind since birth. Um, we were able to, they met the criteria of the trial, and we treated them, and they can see. Mm. And so a lifetime of, of um, vision ahead of them. Wow. And so when we, when I, when we met the, the, um, the team from the pharmaceutical company that was sort of testing to see if we were going to be a, a good trial site or not, um, I asked them what their business plan was. And so the president of the pharma company said, well, we, we want to treat um, 75 patients in the first year. 
That's, that's wonderful, worldwide. That, that's great. Why that? And he said, well, we, we priced it um, at $825,000 per treatment, and we think that's all the families that can afford it. Um, and so that's why we priced it that way. And I said, that's really too bad. That's, 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 that's a kind of a tough position to take. Um, this works. Why don't you price it at a couple hundred thousand dollars or a hundred thousand dollars and treat 300 children or 500 children, you know, whatever the math might work out to be, and, um, because it works. And you're gonna grant these, these precious children a lifetime of eyesight that they wouldn't have or, ordinarily had. And he said, no, my stockholders will never let me, let me do that. And there he is today selling. But see, don't you wonder if he ever put it to his stockholders that way? Oh. I, I don't I, think so. I'd, I'd love to go to one of their stockholder meetings. It would be, yeah. be, be a fun day. So um, we'd love to open it up for questions. Jeff, we have a few minutes, so why don't we open it up for questions? And um, rather than us talking about things that are of interest to us, we'd love to hear from you. And we could talk all day up here, by the way. Hi. Um, since you brought up gene therapy, and I'm just curious, at the intersection of social good, um, precision medicine and technology, and uh, genetic testing, variants of unknown significance, what about the ethical duty to report back to patients? Has that sort of come into um, report, your... Report what back to patients? Oh, so let's say that um, you have a genetic test done, or let's say that you're at the hospital and you have some lab work done, and something comes back of unknown significance at the time. But with uh, technology moving the way it does and artificial intelligence and whatnot and big data, a lot of these variants, genetic variants of unknown significance can suddenly become significant. And so who has the ethical duty um, to report back to the patient? Is it the hospital lab? Is it the hospital? Is it And the, it might be nobody. It might be the physician? Here, here, no, here's, here's the reason. When we first started to be able to test for uh, familial Alzheimer's disease, it was on the same gene, on the same chromosome, and very close to the same place as uh, APOE marker for uh, heart disease. Yeah. So we were finding out, uh, we were testing somebody for heart disease and then finding accidentally uh, uh, what might be a link or a mark for familial Alzheimer's disease. Once we knew, and that gave us your problem. Once we knew that, we had to, the institutional review boards that, that review um, all genetic testing and all other kinds of, of these, these kinds of things, um, uh, clinical trials, needed to say to patients, we're gonna find out a lot of things about you and we might not know what they mean right now. You can either ask us to get back to you when we know something, and you'll have to know that we might not be able to do anything about that when we call you, or we might, or you can say to us, you know what, I'm giving you my blood for the test you're interested in, I don't wanna know anything else. Especially because that gap between knowing that the sort of Damocles is over your head and also knowing that there's, how many of you would want to know if you were going to get Alzheimer's disease in the next 10 years? Okay, how many of you would not want to know? Not as many, but there are people who absolutely want to live their lives without, uh, um, Without that knowledge, one of the um, the Nancy Wexler, who discovered the gene for um, Huntington's disease, which is autosomal dominant, meaning if one of your parents had it, you have a 50/50 chance of getting it, and you'll you'll exhibit symptoms after you've had children because it's late onset. Nancy Wexler's mother, I believe, had HD. She discovered the gene for it, her sister wanted to know, and she did not. So I, the, the reason I say maybe nobody is because we have to get that back to patients. We can't assume that everybody wants that knowledge, but we can't assume that nobody wants it either. So we have to think ahead. 
a sort of slightly different view. Um, so just to, on, on, on the heels of your, of your questioning, when I was at UC San Diego, we developed a full-blown genomic sequencing infrastructure. And what, not exome, full-blown genomic sequencing, is we got a grant from a local individual, and we had the opportunity to do full genome sequencing on every single one of our 1,300 faculty. And we sent a note to them. If you want your full-blown genomic sequencing done and a full-blown annotated genetic assessment, sign here. Half of our faculty said no, thank you. Physician scientists, half of them said no. Don't know why, but to your, to, to your first question, um, I say we do. We have an obligation. And so at Children's Hospital Los Angeles, we have a center for personalized medicine. We do a lot of genomic testing on children. And we make a commitment to them that with every discovery of every actionable gene actionable. That, that we have in that context, we have an obligation, whether it's today, five years from now, or 30 years from now, we will notify the patient and the family that something actionable has turned up in that sequence. Not actionable, not our, not, not our thing, of but course. if it's actionable. And, and I think that's critical. Yeah. That makes it Which is difference. really commendable just because it's, it's time consuming and, um, in, you know, what does the insurance pay and yeah. just the burden. So that's, yeah, this, 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 I commend this, you for, for this doing that. This is on us. This isn't on anybody's insurance. Yeah, so. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> There's something you could do about it. And it can be cured. Or well, treated or, or kept at bay. Don't tell them about everything until it's actionable. That's correct. Right. That, that's our view. So but that they don't worry until you tell them, oh, guess what? You have this, but we'll take care of it. Until we know we, something, we can do something about it, then okay. no, no, no sense knowing is sort of the, sort of the view. Anybody else? Yes, please. I love the story of the patient with diabetes, right, mm. and trying to create that experience where there's the experience that I guess is thought beyond just the hospital and even maybe before. What are the, the challenges with making more of those connections uh, through different organizations and also with technology, right, utilizing technology to help make that experience much more seamless and better for the patient? One of the biggest challenges, so there's the human and the tech challenges. The human challenge is to make, to, to help the partners, all the different partners that can have an impact on this, see that it is in everybody's interest to work together. So the more your social skills, the more your, you know, that, that's a positive thing. The technology challenges, frankly, are with the, um, we shortchange it to HIPAA, the health insurance, portability, and it's another P. Protection. Protection Act. Um, so when you come to me as your clinician, I take down all the stuff and I don't tell him. When you go to him as, his, as your clinician, he writes down all the stuff. We're not supposed to talk to each other. So if we're partners in trying to take care of you, it would be really good if we could talk to each other. So there's a whole little legal subculture that works on those HIPAA issues um, so that the partners can, without violating anybody's confidentiality, work together to help. That's, that's one set of challenges. The other set of challenges really revolves around the magnitude of, of, of the challenge. So to diabetes specifically, there are two and a half million children live in LA County today. So under 18 years of age, two and a half million. The latest estimate is 40% of them are either type 2 diabetic or pre-diabetic and will be full-blown type 2 within three years. 40% of 2.5 million children. So how, how, do you, how do you cope with the magnitude of trying to test, evaluate, inform, educate, provide medication? It is overwhelming when no one person really has ownership of it. It's back to partnerships and working with others and trying to educate the, the community. And going way upstream to recognize that there are a lot of inputs to that 40% number. And it's not all about, um, you know, genetics or what you have at dinner, wh how your mother cooks. It's what your mother can buy in the store and what your, and what they can what your and school and stocks in its cafeteria and all that stuff. Going back to 
providers, um, you made the uh, interesting observation that what you can tell somebody when somebody can tell you might prevent the best standard of care because legally there's pieces that prevent you from communicating. In an environment of electronic medical records where that access could lead to better care, how do you see um, what hospitals are going to have to do based on versus, you know, law versus technology that's creating a totally new environment where the old laws and regulatory policies that were enacted to protect privacy fundamentally shift? And, and prevent good care. Well, you're talking to somebody who thinks that we ought to have a national health care system. It ought to be one system like in other civilized countries. It ought to be one system. And we ought to have it on our credit card. And if, we, if you look at Finland, man, it's not just your health care that's on one credit card size little thing that you put in. It's your school records. It's your everything. It's your driver's uh, history. It's your business stuff, and only you control it. Um, but it, it, it requires um, less of a pioneer spirit and every man for himself than we have in this country. Um, you made an interesting comment uh, when we were talking about the genomic sequencing. And as we become more, as technology allows us to become more aware of what exists, um, Stephen Hawking uh, wrote an interesting article about superhumans and, um, and wealth to access accesses. So if you are able to know what prophylactic care you should do to prevent some of these onsets, um, do you see there being a concern from a social perspective of this, what Hawking talks about is the superhuman elite that comes from access to that technology, the information, and of course ability to pay, assuming that insurance companies wouldn't be a partner in this. I, I don't even, uh, I stop short of the superhuman. I think we have um, a proclivity, which we are seeing in spades in the last two years, toward discrimination. So it, it, if, if people don't do it, don't enhance, there will be a pressure, and there will be a, a haves and a have-nots physiologically, not just economically. If you haven't seen the movie Gattaca, you should. Anybody else? Paul? Thank oh, you. Wonderful to spend Thanks. time with you. Thank you all so much. Thank you very much for what you represented. The intention of today is to speak about industry, business, and social impact, but to really get very granular and specific and see in concrete ways how industries are grappling with these issues. You saw that represented in Stephen's presentation and the way in which industry has come together around these partnerships. You see that in this healthcare dialogue, really informed by working to make decisions that extend and respect the values that are foundational to those organizations and grapple with data points like 40% of the children in LA County being diabetic or pre-diabetic. These are broad, powerful social needs that require profound response. And so we thank our panelists for giving information related to that. We're gonna take a break in just a second. Please don't get up yet. We're gonna take a 20 minute break and then we're gonna to continue to have dialogue with our second healthcare panel, continuing to look at the question of where the rubber hits the road and how organizations engage these profound questions. But before we do that, I would like to ask Dr. Jason Amello, a professor of entrepreneurship here at Loyola Marymount's College of Business Administration, to share a bit of a program and an opportunity that students participate in related to uh, Startup Weekend and identifying one example of a student uh, business that came from that. Dr. DeMille. Okay, good afternoon. So uh, besides serving on the Institute of Business Ethics and Sustainability, I represent our Fred Kiesner Center for Entrepreneurship, uh, of which I'm also a, pr a product of as a student uh, back in 2010. And, uh, but I get the honor of working with our young entrepreneurs here at LMU and helping, helping them take ideas and, and turn them into real businesses. 
and uh, it's, it's, it's a super pleasure to, to be able to do so. David Choi, Dr. David Choi is our director and he's in the back. Uh, we have a great team and one of the things we do is we try to promote entrepreneurship both in and outside of the classroom. And every November we host Startup Weekend as part of Global Entrepreneurship Week. So November 16th through 18th this year, um, hundreds of folks from the community, both on campus and off, will get together and start a business over 54 hours. And it's really, really fun. There's many students in here that participated or will participate. I encourage you all to, to join us this year, even if you're not a student. Um, it's, 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 a, it's a great experience. Um, one, of, uh, one of the topics for today is talking about how technology can be used for social good. And uh, two years ago at Startup Weekend, one of our groups of students took on a, pro a problem that we all face here in LA that you could probably all relate to with uh, related to parking. And uh, since then, they've pivoted several times, I think four times, uh, to get to the business model that, that they're in now. But this was an idea that just was born out of a weekend collaboration. And two years later is a funded business. Uh, you, can, you can see them over here uh, exhibiting their, their product and offering a great deal for all of you guys here today. So uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Leo, Lauren, and Andrew from Reserve. And they're going to tell you a little bit about their company. Thank you, Professor DeMello. Um, my name is Joseph Screen, and this is the Reserve Team. Uh, we're here to build technology that will make parking more affordable and easier to find. Um, yeah, so uh, we all know that parking is uh, extremely ridiculous in Los Angeles, I mean, across the world. But um, the, two war the two worst parts of it is it's overpriced and it's difficult to find. Um, what Reserve does is eliminates these two problems by making it more affordable through a subscription-based service and more accessible through the accompanied application. Um, and this application will be able to direct drivers to open parking stalls as well as inform them of what areas are congested and what areas are not uh, at a given time. Um, and more on how it works is Lauren. So when a user signs up, we send them one of these cards and you get to park a certain amount of times based on the subscription that you pay for. So for example, one of our plans is $20 and you get to park eight times, the other one's $150. You can park once a day, every day. And we'll be having the app that we add on later which will direct you to open parking spots within the LA area. Also along with this, we'd like to thank LMU because we wouldn't be in this position that we are today without them and all the professors and the mentor and guidance that you know, have been supporting us up to this point. So thank you very much. But yeah, check us out. <laughs> We're over there. Learn more. So let's reconvene at 305. Bathrooms are down the hall to the right. Refreshments are in the back. Please, opportunity for dialogue, and we'll call you back at 305. Thank you.